Good afternoon. This is Dr. Dan Guerra, and you are at Authentic Biochemistry Podcast Studios in the Inland Pacific Northwest. <clears throat> I'm giving you a video lecture today because I've been doing way too many audio lectures, and sometimes I feel like it's a better thing to um, <clears throat> do video because I can show you what I'm talking about, especially when there's a structure involved. <clears throat> and biochemistry is a lot about structure and function, as you know. So let me get started with this lecture. Go back one and tell you more about what we're going to discuss today. And also a little bit more about what I want to say about authentic biochemistry. You know that I have an authentic biochemistry podcast. It's on all the major platforms. And it's audio because the kind of platform that I, the kind of structure I use to make those lectures do not support video. Now I can record video and then upload them into that structure, that podcast structure. But there's a lot of technical difficulties about it. The length that you can do, the quality of it and whatnot. So I haven't quite perfected that. I'm working on it. <clears throat> but I don't work much on any of the audiovisual material end of things. That is the technical end of it. Because I'm what I do in authentic biochemistry is I go into the primary scientific literature. And from my background as a lipid biochemist, both as a research scientist and as a professor at multiple universities where I've taught, and take that primary literature and discuss it with it within that corpus of understanding of biochemistry so that you don't have a canned lecture on say cavioli or gangliosides. You have a, a lecture which will discuss those two biochemical phenomena within the, within the matrix of the published refereed peer-reviewed journal articles, mostly in biomedicine, but also I talk about straightforward biochemistry, so cells, animal models, and also just plain old in vitro, KM, Vmax of enzyme reactions and whatnot, enzyme catalyzed reactions. So I kind of do all of that. And the reason I'm going through this, if you have already, if you're a subscriber and you won't listen to me, then you're fully aware of what I do. But I don't have, I think, the audience I'd really like to get. I'd really like to have more people listen to this because <clears throat> I don't believe that there's a great deal of authentic research science discussed, uh, certainly not on the Internet in lecture halls across the country and around the world, hopefully there are still good lectures taught in physiology, biochemistry, molecular genetics, microbiology, subjects like that. I haven't taught at the university setting for a few years now, but when I did, I made every effort possible to give the kind of detail that I'm doing here in these podcasts and video lectures online. And I think that what we need most in education, particularly in the sciences, particularly in my science, biochemistry and related fields, is in-depth understanding of the current research, not some established scientific paradigm. Because even saying that, phrase, established scientific paradigm, is itself sort of <clears throat> an oxymoron. Because science isn't something that's already completed. You should always modify the word science with an adjective, and that adjective is research. Research science. And research scientists like myself, who go into the laboratory, at least that's what I did most of my career, ever since I was a teenager, really. Started working at laboratories at the University of Illinois when I was uh, not quite 19 years old, 
when I ate between 18 and 19, my freshman year. Um, and then now I'm, I'm not older than that. But what I'm saying is that research science is quite different than textbook science. And it's certainly dramatically different than what they call science on modern media. Because what's called science is usually being discussed by people who are not scientists. And I make that very clear. And for the years I've been doing teaching, which have been over 30 years, well over 30 years now, and more in particular when I've been doing it online. So a person who is a physician, for example, a medical doctor, that's what they do for a living. They are medical doctors. Now, some people with MDs do research in the laboratory, but 90% or better of what's conducted in the laboratory setting is not conducted by MDs, but by PhDs. And that, and in fact, we not only conduct most of the research, we also at least traditionally have been the major professors in medical schools because we can discuss research science and not the practice of medicine. Now, there are many courses a medical doctor will take, and some of them do involve working with patients. And there's a, there's a whole gamut of, of uh, education a medical doctor has to have. It's not related to the disciplines in which they derive some of their work from. But what really bothers me is when someone with no real research scientific training, particularly administrator type people, try to get in front of a camera and act like they know something about research science. Because almost always what they're saying in front of the camera is so watered down that it isn't really research science at all. And to call something science, just that, as I said, has really no meaning to the disciplines. Okay. Cause it sounds like it's like a scripture and science is not scripture. It's not something that is so well accepted that what is written is written in stone. Um, nothing like that in research science. And that includes all the biomedical derivations of, of things like biochemistry, physiology, molecular genetics, etc., immunology, all the different disciplines that we discuss here. Okay. So my telos, is to give you the real, authentic, that is, research scientific discussions and explanations at the level of a dialectical event ontology of what's being published in the scientific literature. It doesn't have to be just current, of course, because the current lit literature has yet to have been established as any kind of paradigmatic understanding of even the most subtle of interactions within a cell, such as a pathway regulation, let alone how a pathway can be associated with a pathophysiology that can lead to, say, a human disease like megablastoma, glioblastoma, just an example, right? So what I'm saying is that I'm giving you this long prolegomena so that you understand what I do here and what I continue to try to do in my audio podcast and will proceed that way until I've decided I'm finished with it. Okay. All right. So it's kind of, it's kind of serious and because what I talk about is serious, but understand that I realize that what I understand about this field is an associated concretion of my entire life experience in the field. And so can I be wrong? Can I be um, misinformed even? Of course. 
as can anyone in any field, right? But I really make it <clears throat> my duty to derive from the scientific literature what is known currently. And that means I take material that's published right now in mid-2022, in July of 2022, but I can go all the way back to publish literature in the 90s or the 80s or the 70s. It doesn't matter. And that's because those papers, that research, very often gives the kind of detail you need to be able to not only interpret and understand the current literature, and that means the current research science that's being discussed in that literature, but also that older literature can inform whether or not the current research is going in a direction that is has a foundation and is coherent with what we already understand. <clears throat> Remember, understanding has to do with an abstraction of experiences. That means concepts. That's what concepts populate the faculty of understanding, that component of our rational mind. But the other very important thing that we have to deal with in knowledge is we have to understand those specific experiences, that is research information, that is evidence, okay? So you have concepts, which are abstractions, which is part of the induction process in research science. But the hypothetical deductions that lead to experimental design that result in uh, those experiments being conducted in a research laboratory with multiple controls, that's where it leads to a clear understanding of the motivations of the researchers. And those motivations are based on what is currently understood in the field and conceptually framed within the imagination, which is populated by ideas. So ideas are more related to what if, what, how, the, um, asking questions like, how does this work? What are, what are the mechanisms, right, involved in this process? Say something like tissue differentiation or immune cell differentiation, okay? So the whole gambit of metaphysics has to be brought into play when you discuss research science. By metaphysics, I mean, what are the material and physical phenomena that relate to our discussion of this research at the level of comprehension. And then of course, using logic to carry out the hypothetical deductions, the experimental designs, the experiments themselves, the examination of data, the determination that the data can be can be part of a composition of evidence. And then that discussion of that evidence related to now perhaps a new knowledge base on a continued continuum of subjects. Okay. All right, so sorry for that long intro, but I wanna make sure because I, I don't know how many people listen to this, uh, it's particularly when I go to the video. So today we're going to talk about ganglia signs and KVLA associated disease. Now, if you've been listening to the last 21 audio lectures on this um, arc of lectures I've been doing for the last month and a half, <clears throat> you would know exactly what gangliosides are and what KVLA are. Now, if you're just listening to a video, or I mean, that is watching this video and listening to me, and you don't go back and listen to any of that, it's not that you'll be lost, it's just you will be woefully underprepared for what we're going to talk about. So that is a huge hint in the direction of 
please go listen to Authentic Biochemistry Podcast, the audio. No, you won't see me giving the lecture, but you'll hear me. Okay? It's the same guy, both places. You can count on it. Now, gangliosides are a certain kind of sphingolipid, and caveoli, that's the plural, are organized sections of plasma membranes in eukaryotic cells that are involved in the docking and reception of specific lipid components that can move from the external environment to the internal environment of the cell and then the other direction. So there's a lot of endocytosis and exocytosis involved in KVOA. KVOA are specific domains of a membrane that are involved with very important biochemical interactions, sometimes just within the cell, but gaining information by moving up to the plasma membrane and coming back into the cell, into the endomembrane system, all the way to the level of controlling gene expression, alteration of metabolic pathways, as well as very specific um, biosynthetic procedures that involve the mitochondrion, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi network, as well as the peroxisome and the nucleus for the manufacture of specific compounds, particularly complex lipids. But within those lipids, because they're moving through the ER Golgi apparatus and making it to a caveolic structure, as a membrane, proteins that are embedded within membrane lipid rafts that are translocated from their site of synthesis to their, to their use in the plasma membrane and then trapped back into the cell. And various aspects of that, proteins coming in and going out as a maturation process and a conciliatory process based on the real time experiences of that cell within that tissue mass within that organism. Okay, so the communication network very high in the caveoli. Another important thing about caveoli is that the lipids that you find there are particularly resistant to denaturation. That's how they were discovered. So caveoli tend to have relatively um, detergent resistant lipid layers. Now with the detergent resistant, because we know that because when we open up cells, we use usually non-ionic detergents to open up cells. So we can see what's going on inside them in terms of nucleic acids, proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, things like that. But, they're, but the KVL are detergent resistant, which means that they are of a structure that can be modified plastically and elastically as a communication network from the external environment to the internal environment and not be destroyed because of the buildup of say reactive oxygen or, or changes in pH for that matter, or salt concentration or temperature, you see. So they're more resistant to turnover. So that makes KVL a particularly interesting structures to biochemists as well as to physiologists. Okay, so let's go into the lecture. Cavioli have various protein components. And those proteins include ones that are not part of the structure, but that are carried in by the membrane lipid raft. But the ones that are part of the structure are of two major families. The caviolins called calves, CAVs, and then the cavins. Okay. So the caviolins include cav one and cav three. As it says down here, they're major proteins of the caviola. And these are domains. So these are protein maps. So the domains that a cav one or a cav three may have is going to include this CSD, which is a scaffolding domain. And that tells you that that protein is part of the ultrastructure of the KVOA system within the membrane. 
the proteins are part of that three-dimensional structure that exists in time in that membrane. Okay. So that's what it means by a CSD. It's shown here, a scaffolding domain. It's where other proteins and other lipids can react with to find a specific geometric space-time continuum within that membrane. Then you have something called the IM, and that's just simply the membrane domain, right? The intramembrane domain. So that's usually an alpha helical structure for that protein. That's so that it can embed within the membrane itself. Think about a bilayer. Now, there are other regions of these proteins you could talk about. I'm going to just mention here because this diagram does. You can covalently modify the carboxy terminus of CAB1 and CAB3 by palmitylation. That means like palmitic acid is covalently linked to an amino acid in the somewhere in the carboxy terminus of that protein. Now you'll know that pal palmitylation of a polypeptide will lead to it being trafficked into a membrane. And so it allows for the interdigitation of a polypeptide, which erstwhile could have some water soluble characteristics. Oh, how dreadful, right? In a membrane with all that beautiful hydrophobicity. And the palmitic acid can tremendously change the solution chemistry of the polypeptide, such that the protein can be associated with membranes where before it couldn't. Yeah. So that's a couple of features of caveolins. Then you have cabins. Here it's showing you four different structures of them. Also, where do you find these? So the CAB1 is ubiquitous in all KVOA. CAB3 is more common in the cardiac as skeletal muscle. So if you, well, you don't remember if you didn't listen to the podcast, the audio podcast, but KVOA are really enriched in muscle and in adipose and also in the central nervous system. Okay. So it shows you a little bit about where they're found. Cabin proteins, ubiquitous, and wherever you find a caviola, you're going to find cabin one and two and cabin three. But cabin four is more, again, in cardiac and skeletal muscle. And you can see the domains here, right? So you've got what's called a disordered region that has to do with amino acid, uh, not just sequence, but the way that it folds into a secondary structure. And you've got this thing called the HR, which is the helical region. Now you have this PIP2, that's phosphatidylinositol bisphosphate, right? a specific location of the protein where you have a PIP binding site. Now phosphatidylinositol phosphates come in various types of, types of substitution where the phosphate is on the inositol sugar of that phosphoglycerolipid. And those are very important signaling molecules embedded in the membrane. Now they have specific binding sites to proteins, associations, I should call them. Then you have another disordered region. Then you have this thing called the UC, which is the undeca, which is an, means it has 11 amino acids, repeat domain. Okay. So there are repeat domains in these cabins. Right. And some of them have a very conserved region. Some of them don't seem to have it at all. But cabin one is a very prominent one here. Yeah. More disordered regions down here. Now, there are other proteins you find in KVOA. The EHD, which is an EPS-15 homology domain. I know that doesn't explain anything. I explained it in great detail in the audio lectures. I don't have time today to do it in the video. But this protein is often found also in KVOA, ubiquitous. The, Paskin, the Pax, Paxin proteins as well. Now there's some interesting motifs in there. Remember, these are domains, okay, of the polypeptide. So they have these F-bar protein, F-bar domains, NPF domains, this SH domain, which is ubiquitous in many proteins involved in um, scaffolding phenomena in a cell. We talked a lot about those again in uh, the uh, video on uh, the audio lectures. Um, okay, so 
I'm not going to discuss this in great detail. The ROAR one we talked a lot about. There's a great deal of, of uh, domains involved in that. This ROAR protein interacts with other polypeptides, which are not part of the structural feature of the caveolin. And these other polypeptides are sorted in and out of the caveole system and then create a functional um, dynamic for the caveole to be purposed in a specific tissue, like say adipose versus skeletal muscle versus cardiac muscle versus the central nervous system. So this is just kind of an overview of the different polypeptides you will encounter in a caveolar structure. Okay. Now, more detail. Mammals possess three caveolin genes. Caveolins themselves, you just saw some of the domain structure, small, oligomeric, cholesterol binding protein. That's right, they bind cholesterol. Both the N terminus and the carboxy terminus, the amino and the carboxy termini, face the cytoplasm, okay? So it's one of these proteins that's looped through the membrane, but both ends of the polypeptide, the amino terminus and the carboxy terminus, end up being cytoplasmically oriented, which means that they're going to interact with the cytoplasm. And they adopt a hairpin formation within the membrane, okay? Secondary structures. There are four distinct domains that have been operationally defined. The N terminus, the residues one through 81, in human cab one that can serve scaffolding domain, I just showed you, residues 82 to 102 amino acid inward. And then the intramembrane domains, which are about 103 to 133, usually alpha helical. Carboxy terminus then wraps up the last part of the polypeptide. So these are the domains I just showed you. The carboxy terminus of cab one is palmitylated and the N terminus shows highly regulated phosphorylation patterns, particularly on conserved tyrosine residues, which can become phosphorylated because they have a free hydroxyl group, right? Of course they do. Now there's this distinct family of proteins, again, called the cavins. You saw their structure already. They form oligomeric complexes in the KVOA, and they're recruited to the KVOA via membrane lipid rat mobilization from the Golgi. They stabilize the caveolar formation as it's forming and when it's set formed, okay? So cabin one binds, as I showed you, to phosphatidylinacetyl 4,5-bisphosphate and also phosphatidylserine, which is just a phosphoglycerol lipid. And such binding contributes to the stabilization of the domain of the caveoli that have a cav one. Now, let's talk about the caveolar lipids. We talked about the proteins. Purified caveoli are enriched with cholesterol, because I told you there's some cholesterol binding in the caveolar protein itself, and specific like the lipids. So you have glycerol lipids, you have, you have prenolipids like cholesterol. Then you have Schwingel, so all three classes are represented. And one of the particular ones is ganglioside GM3. I'm gonna show you what gangliosides are like and how they're synthesized in a moment. That reminds me, that's why I put it in a different color and I put a little asterisk there. But they're rich in particular gangliosides as compared to bulk plasma membrane. Peptides derived from caveolin can recognize, that is can organize around lipids when incorporated to liposomes with a particular specificity for cholesterol and ethosylinostol 4,5-bisphosphate. And also, as I said, phosphatidylserine. It's a glycerol lipid. The oligomers of caveolin might generate a specific lipid environment. Okay, So a lipid domain or a lipid protein domain. Cavin proteins also show lipid binding activity, possessing both that PIP P2 binding site in that HR1 domain and a phosphatidyl serine binding site. Protein binding to those lipids generally are required 
to, to produce a biochemically functional domain. Okay. Specific lipids may not only be required for KBL formation, but also may be able to perturb the formation. This has been studied as well, obviously. The blood-brain barrier generally maintains a high impermeability and shows a very low density of KBOI. So the more KBOI, the more permeable, but not permeable simply by diffusion, passive diffusion, but by facilitated diffusion. Okay. So any genetic ablation of the lipid flipase, which is a protein called MFSD2A, and that's responsible for transporting long chain polyunsaturated fatty acid containing phospholipid species from the outer to the inner cytoplasmic leaflet of endothelial cell membranes. Any problem with an ablation of that enzyme causes the appearance of caveoli and increases vascular permeability. You see how these can be modified in situ. So that finding suggests that the wild type BBB, blood brain barrier, all important in the central nervous system for controlling, for example, the movement of pathogens into the brain, because you have quite a sterile environment, as you might guess, in the CNS, right? And you also have resident macrophages, the microglia, in case there are um assaults into the central nervous system but you have a very 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 rigid if you want to look at it wall which is the blood brain barrier so any specific polyunsaturated fatty acid containing phospholipids that make it in there that are not appropriate for being in there will cause an inhibition of kvo like formation now that's really interesting right because you already know that there are VLC puffers that are enriched in the, in the central nervous system. These include icosapentaenoic and docosaxanoic acids. They're highly enriched omega-3 fatty acids in the human CNS. So what I'm telling you here is that the sorting of those fatty acids, which are not coming in as free fatty acids, they're coming in as lipid, complex lipids, sphingolipids, phosphoglycerol lipids, for example, there's going to be a screening response through that blood brain barrier. And the KVOLA, when they are there, are going to be responsible for that screening sorting process. So, this is a way to particularly enrich for very long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids of the omega 3 positional species, molecular species. Right? You see how that works. So that's how membranes are. They're very dynamic structures. And KVOI within them enhance that dynamic role. Now, it's a lot of writing, but you know, it's easier for me to read it than for me to um, put it in my mind and say it in a way that will get all the information quickly. Okay. So glycerol sphingolipids, including the gangliosides, and these are going to be carbohydrate modified sphingolipids. And you can, as you can guess, you're going to be in the CNS or in the peripheral nervous system. Are primarily synthesized in the endoplasmic reticulum and further modified in the Golgi. And you get a sequential addition of carbohydrate, right? So these are going to be glycolipids, glycosphingolipids. So reaction is going to be character is going to be characterized by specific glycosyl transferases. It's going to be, they're going to be functional in the ER and the Golgi. With the exception of one of them called GM4, which is derived directly from galactosyl ceramide, Galsur, most gangliosides are synthesized from lactosyl ceramide. So that means there's a lactose involved as a first component covalent modification of a sphingolipid. Right? That means it's going to contain the, the disaccharide uh, glucose galactose. That's what lactose is. Now, there's a simple gangliocyte called GM3, which is synthesized by the addition of a sialic acid, which I'm going to discuss in a moment here, to 
lactoseal ceramide, and it's the reaction requires CMP sialic acid. So that is the substrate for the addition of sialic acid, which is itself a carbohydrate. Okay. So lactoseal ceramide alpha 2 3 sial transferase, that's the enzyme, or it's also known as just simply GM3 synthase. GD3 and GT3 are also synthesized by sequential addition of acetic acid to GM3 and GD3 by a nucleotide sugar, right? Cytosine monophosphate sialyl acid. GM3 alpha 2 8 sialotransferase, known as ST2 or GD3 synthase, and another CMP sialic acid. GD3 alpha 2 complex, uh, excuse me, eight sialotransferase. Okay, I think I went through that. Of more complex gangliosides belonging to the A, B, and C series, respectively. So you have all these different enzymes using typically nucleotide sugars as substrates used to modify the base gangliosidic structure, which is being synthesized in the ER moving through the Golgi, showing up in the KVOLA. So there's an elaboration of all of those individual reactions. And you can look at the names of some of these enzymes, udp gal nac lac sir GM3, GD3, GD3, beta-1, 4N, acetyl, galactosaminyl transferase, okay? And going on with a different beta-1,3, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm showing you that detail because that's the complexity of the system. All those enzymes are embedded in the ER or the Golgi, depending on where they're modifying the sphingolipid. And they are hierarchical. That means there's a coordinated ordination of the addition of all of those sugars. So you need the substrate, you need nucleotide sugars, you need the enzymes. Any minor alteration of any of these enzymatic reactions can result in terrifically corrupted central nervous system, membranous systems. And what that means is yes, we know about them in great detail. Many of those are lipid storage disorder, inborn errors of metabolism, genetic defects, in any one of these given enzymes. That's why we know so much detail about them. These are all human diseases, right? Human diseases, right? Schwingolipidoses are also called, but the lipid storage diseases. And sometimes they're associated with cholesterol storage issues as well. Not because so much of the cholesterol causing the disease, but because of the interaction of cholesterol with the production of the schwingolipids, modifying the membrane domains and then therefore modifying signal transduction. Expression levels of patterns of galactose series of gangliosides undergo dramatic changes during brain development. What kind of brain development? In utero brain development, trimester one, trimester two, trimester three, during gestation. That's correct. During fetal development, right? Fetal central nervous system development. Some of those can go awry. Post uh, parturition more complex interaction of central nervous system biosynthetic pathways, and then all the way through to the end of adolescence, puberty, and young adulthood, all of those lipid modifications constantly occurring in a st stochastic that is somewhat random, yet coordinated hierarchical um, biosynthetic alteration motif that leads to the mature human central nervous system as modified by experience. So that's individual for each individual to have a specific lipid domain within the central nervous system and then protein domain within that lipid, um, ultimately yielding a central nervous system is unique to every individual. Okay. 
the brain developed, that's what I say here, the expression of those simple gangliosides, they are relatively simple, becomes downregulated with a concomitant upregulation of the very complex ones, some of which involve those enzymatic reactions. So the change in expression levels and patterns of gangliosides can be largely attributed to the development of change in expression levels of the patterns of the synthases. So some of these enzymes are not turned on, say, in week six of gestation, but they're turned on between wait weeks 10 and 11, and then they're shut off again. So there's a constant migration of alteration of gene expression, which leads to very specific retailering of central nervous system membrane lipids, which are absolutely necessary for normal fetal development. And this process continues on through gestation, parturition, post parturition, first two years in particular, major modifications of membrane lipids. And then beyond that, every year of life until old age, senescence and death. Yeah. All right. Now, these Going all the way back to sialic acid, remember I told you I will tell you something about that. It's a class of sugars that are called sialic acids, typically found at the outermost end of glycan chains of all cell types. So they're part of the recognition sequence, for example, of viruses, such as influenzae. So they're acidic sugars. They have nine carbon motifs. That's the backbone. They decorate all cell surfaces and many secreted polypeptides. You find it mostly in vertebrates and sometimes in higher invertebrates. They mediate or modulate a variety of normal and unfortunately pathological processes. First, by virtue of their negative charge and hydrophilicity. So they will bind in aqueous environment, because they're carbohydrates after all. Sialic acid have many structural modulatory roles, okay, because they're also, they're associated, remember, they're covalent modification of lipids, okay? So these are glycolipids. Second category of functional sialic acids also serves components of binding sites for various pathogens that I just mentioned, and unfortunately also toxins as produced by bacteria, parasites, things like that. Yeah. So here's a figure showing you two major sialic acids. That's N-acetylneuraminic acid, NUC5-ac. And there's two keto 3 deoxy nanonic acid, or also known as KDN. So primary sialic acids shown here are the 5-acid amido, 2-keto, 3-5-dideoxy-D-glycerol-D-galactinomic acid. N acetyl, also known as N acetylneuraminic acid. And again, there's the shorter nomenclature. Then there's the two keto 3 deoxy, this one over here. You can follow along the structures as I'm mentioning to you. Uh, and that's those as KDN. And the only difference between these two is the substitution at C5, okay, right there, C5, okay. All other salic acids are metabolically derived from those two. So you get a great deal of modification of the glycocalyx of a membrane and therefore of a cell by adding specific carbohydrate moieties to lipids. Okay. This is again, where a lot of the organization around cell-cell interactions occur. What kind of interactions? maybe bacterial cells, maybe leukocytes and lymphocytes generating synaptic interactions. That's correct. So this N-acetylneuraminic acid, NU5-ac, is more common than KDN in most vertebrate cell types. And the bonds of the anomeric center, that's the carbon-2, are drawn to indicate muter rotation between the alpha and beta anomeric forms in solution. Like all with all carbohydrates, you have a lot of stereochemistry involved. 
And that serial chemistry is going to lead to different structural functional domains within the membrane as associated with lipid covalent modifications of those lipids. So glycosidically bound sialic acids and naturally occurring glycans are in the alpha form and free sialic acids in solution are mainly in the beta form. Just so you know. Again, this is authentic biochemistry. This isn't regular biochemistry lecture in some undergraduate course in any university, doesn't matter where. Because you're not listening to those professors, you're listening to this one. Who likes his lipids? Because he's a lipid biochemist. Now, the original, uh, here's more detail. The original biochemical evolutionary theories offers that the sialic acids were unique inventions of the deutero, of the deuterostome lineage of animals, which emerged around the time of the Cambrian expansion of Animalia some half a billion years ago. So they're very ancient carbohydrates. And there's certain pathogenic bacteria that also have them, but they acquired them very likely by interaction with hosts by gene transfer, not by carbohydrate transfer, obviously. Because you remember that bacteria have plasma DNA, can pick up genes from a host and incorporate those genes into their genome and therefore have biosynthetic capacity to synthesize something like a sialic acid. That's correct. Presumably afforded some kind of beneficial uh, phenomena to the bacteria to pick up those carbohydrate biosynthetic pathways. What kind of benefit do you think that might give them? Maybe a cloaking device so that they would look like the host cells. Parasites do this often. Some bacteria are parasites, some bacteria are just straight up pathogens, and some, of course, are uh, commensal organisms in the gut. Right. Beneficial. Now, Gives you an idea about all the different things you can consider when you look at a given structure, biochemical structure. And you're going to be looking, you've seen this one before. You've seen some of these already, right? And there's three more, right? Now, relevant genes of bacterial pathogens were then found to be only distantly homologous to the corresponding host genes. And the unusual nine carbon backbone of sialic acids is in fact shared by a larger family of non-ulosonic acids, nine carbon fatty acids, or, or, no, excuse me, not fatty acids, carbohydrates, which are much more widely distributed in nature. As you find them in plants too. Okay. Oh, aghast plants. Furthermore, the key steps in the biosynthesis of the non-ulosonic acids, nine carbon uh, sugars, share remarkable similarities in the genes involved are somewhat synonymous. Sugars play an essential pattern recognition role. I haven't already said it, that's what they're doing. Right? Pattern recognition on the surface of a glycoprotein. And of course, in humans, the interaction often aligned with the immune response, as I've just alluded to. Here's some of the structures. For example, here's one down here 57 diamino 3579 tetradeoxy D glycerol D galacto non acid, also known as. Legionaminic acid. Okay. Now, that has a specific name, legionaminic acid. Now, I wonder why that would be. You have all heard of Legionnaires' disease, right? Well, the docking of that particular bacterium to cause the disease is with that sialic acid residue, discovered during the pathophysiological determination of Legionnaires' disease. That's why I mentioned it. Okay. There's KDN, and et cetera. Okay. So now you got some evolutionary understanding of salic acid, which you wouldn't have had otherwise. Now, here's a whole biosynthetic map of all the possible ganglia signs. Right? I'm going to put on my magic spectacles here. So you have glucose, galactose, and acetylgalactosamine, and then, of course, sialic acid. And you see that these are modifications of a ceramide backbone, which is sphingolipid, where there's an amidated fatty acid, right? And you start add, taking from the 
GLUC-SIR parent molecule, you start adding more sugars. And these are the enzymes that you're involved in this. These are the series of these gangliosides that are going to be synthesized, okay? They're all going to be called that. So you get a stepwise addition of monosaccharides to the ceramide backbone, the sphingolipid. Right, sphingolipids have that sphinganine base structure, which is palmitic, palmitic acid covalently bound to serine. Right, that's the sphinganine base. So they're not cholesterol base, they're sphingolipid base. Um, again, just straightforward with the biochemistry. Now, prescribe mechanisms of glycolipid mediated immunomodulation reveal that tumor shed, tumor shed gangliosides of the extracellular milieu where they are dynamically, they are in dynamic equilibrium between monomeric, multimeric, and larger heteromeric complexed gangliosides, now shed by tumors, okay? So from those various states, they have the potential to transfer different to, to different immune cells. You're talking now about gangliosides, right? And when they do that, they can modify the membrane composition because the lipids can be taken up directly either by the KVOLA, for example, or just by proteins interacting with those sugar-modified lipids. Right? Those galactosyl, sphingosine lipids. Okay? And that can induce mod modifications that modulate the innate and the adaptive immunity. Now of a tumor-adjacent host cell line. And that might favor metastasis. Okay. You see the complexity now. They can be derived from having these very, very significantly biologically active gangliosides on the surface of cells, including cells that are involved in tumor, tumorigenesis and metastasis. Okay. So again, you have the innate immunity where you have all these different interactions going on with various kinds of cytokines and chemokines. Okay, just take a look and read some of that. And you also have the adaptive immunity. So this is, would be the innate immune response, neutrophils, ma monocytes, macrophages, right? Sinophils, um, basophils, um, dendritic cells, all those interactions on this side of the gangliocyte pathway. And then all the adaptive immunity, there's the T cells and B cells with all this potential interaction with different components of the T cells, like TH1, 2, 17, being pro-inflammatory versus T regs, which are anti-inflammatory. Natural killer cells also interact with the gangliosides, have surface gangliocide interactions, dealing with sometimes the MHC, class one, class two interactions, right? Where a lot of lipids are held out there on um, infected cells that are recognized by circulating innate or sometimes acquired immune cell lineages, particularly T cells interacting then with the innate immune cells, right? So gangliosides are mostly expressed in neural tissue. That's true. Abundant expression of the specific gangliosides has been observed in some tumors, as I've been saying. Characteristic feature of small cell lung carcinomas, SL SCLCs, very common cause of uh, high morbidity and mortality in humans, is the aberrant and abundant expression of a particular gangliocide with fucose. That's fucosylated GM1. Fucosylated monocyalo tetrahexacyl gangliocide or 4-2-fuc-2-3-nu-5-ac group 4 ser okay. That's how specific human diseases are relative to glycosidically modified sphingolipids, okay? And a certain buildup of a, a particular lipid like that or an oxygen acetylate derivative can be all the difference in the world between a metastatic and a non-metastatic phenotype. Now, you know that cancer progresses through stages, usually from through four. That progression to a full metastatic disease, high morbidity, mortality, ultimately, 
has to do with alterations of these ganglioside structures mobilizing from the tumor, enhancing metastasis. Now, all that came from a paper published just recently in the National Journal of Molecular Sciences, as you can see. Okay. All these individual interactions with these cytokines and chemokines generated from innate and acquired immune cells. Okay. It's just, I'm not going to go into detail here. I will go through in detail when I cover this in a different arc of lectures. Right now, we're just doing membrane biochemistry. Remember, all of these lectures I've been doing, if hopefully you've been following along in the audio lectures, 21 lectures now, each one about a half an hour, that's 11 hours of lecture, is just talking about general membrane biochemistry and then all the details therein, right? And that's what I'm doing here. I'm still doing much of a conceptual understanding from the primary scientific literature. So we do the induction and we get concepts, which are abstractions of individual specific deductions, which are discrete phenomena in some kind of dialectical event ontology. It's dialectical because we have to bring in at least two components, two biochemical statements to be able to know that there is a distinction between one and the other. Now, of course, it goes way beyond two different lineages. As you can see, all the different modifications just have ganglia signs in association with specific immune responses. Okay. But you have to be able to understand that there is a constant interaction or conversation or dialectic that's going on between a given pathway. Here we're talking about ganglia signs and then any kind of immune associated phenomena and specifically with tumors. So talking about a cancerous lineage, right? And that's why I brought in this paper. Now, a paper published years before that, not ancient times, right? Only uh, five years ago, not quite, because that was August, right? Let's talk, why did I bring up this paper? Let's read through it, okay? Cavioli organized bulk transport and signaling from the plasma membrane to the external matrix and the internal endomembranous system is what is going on with cavioli, right? They function to act as lipid portals where endo and exocytosis of membranous vesicles and membrane, lipid membrane rafts can dock, unload cargo, reload new cargo and traffic. That's a lot of dynamics, right? That's right. It's more than a warehouse. It's like a train yard where the trains are coming from three dimensional and add time, four dimensional space time. Okay. In movements that can be measured at the level of microsecond to millisecond. Because that's real experiential life for a cell and the living system, right? Things are constantly changing internally and externally, as long as you live until you die. And then whatever noumena occurs after that. So KVI also support lipid metabolism, including covalent night, non-covalent modification of those proteins that we just were talking about, like the anastol phosphate, like the pomidolation, but also, not only of those proteins, cavin cave and cavio and cav1, 2, 3, but also G protein coupled receptors and receptor tyrosine kinases, and also all kinds of channels, right? Ion gated channels, sodium channels, potassium channels, calcium calmodulin channels, right? Calcineurin transport. All of that can occur in a caveola because there are enzymes embedded in there that were carried by the membrane lipid raft. Now, let's add a little bit of interesting uh, color to this. Genetic mutations in KVOLR structural proteins like the cabins and the calves, or epigenetic modification of transcription factor mediated alterations in either cytoplasmic or endoorganellar glycerol lipid and sphingolipid pathways, something I was covering before when we were doing cytoepigenetics 
go back and listen to those lectures. I think there were 25 of those in the arc right before membrane biochemistry, cytoepigenetics, where I talked about epigenetic modifications of the mitochondrial genome, the nuclear genome, and then those alterations leading to modifications of metabolism in no organella. What organelles? Mitochondria, the peroxisome, the endoplasmic reticulum, the Golgi apparatus, the phagolysosome, and the nucleus, to name the major ones. Yeah. Okay, that's endoorganeller. Okay. Dealing with glycerol lipid sphingo lipid pathways have been associated with the various kinds of diseases, dyslymphedemia, neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, Lewy bodies, right? Sarcopenia, that's the aging of muscle cells, cardiovascular disease, major cause of death, and of course, cancer, the other major cause of death in humans, right? Cardiovascular disease and cancer are the two major causes of death. Caviolin proteins, we talked about these, you've seen them now, so I can bring them up. Cav ones, two, and three are core components. Remember, this is back in 2017. This is where this stuff was first being discussed. Journal of Biological Chemistry doing this is research science, right? Caviolin self-assemble into disc-shaped oligomers of about seven to 14 monomers. That means you have seven to 14 different polypeptides making an oligomer, right? Caviolin also contains the cavin proteins, as you said, and those self-assemble typically into trimers. The minimal structural unit of caviola is thought to contain about 144 of the CAV monomers associated via uptake subsequent to the initial caviolar genesis of the cavins. Right? And you usually get 20 cavin trimers. Right? So that's 60 different monomers. I mean, they're not different, but 60 associations, right? And all those protein complexes assemble on the membrane to produce a dodecahedral structure. Okay. So the flat faces of that structure of the KVLA are proposed to occupy, be occupied by disks of the calves, whereas the vertices are composed primarily of the trimers of cavin. Structural functional association, something we already talked about in biochemistry. Nothing new there, but giving you the real detail of the caviola. Both protein families bind anionic phospholipids. Major one is, of course, phosphatidylserine. And this one that's really an important signaling lipid, PIP, either 4 or 5, or there's various modifications around that nasophile structure, as I told you, phosphorylation patterns. Um, even all of the sites, all the hydroxyl groups in the sugar can be phosphorylated, and that gives you phytic acid. Um, anyways, PIP4-phosphate and phosphatidylinositol-4,5-bisphosphate, two major ones. Now, using this is what this paper is talking about, live cell single particle trafficking of a green fluorescent protein labeled CAV1 polypeptide and then doing ultrastructural analysis, meaning microscopy, this particular research group five years ago compared the effect of a phosphatidylserine disruption or a PI depletion with KVOI disassembly, which is caused by cabin one loss. Okay. So it's trying to understand which of these proteins are necessary, not just universal for KVOI function. Okay. That's what we're talking about here. The results of this paper showed phosphatidylserine so glycerol lipid plays a necessary role in both KVOI formation and stability. So you need that particular anionic phospholipid. Sequestration or depletion of phosphatidylserine will decrease the number of detectable CAV1 GFP puncta. That's how they're measuring it, right? With the green fluorescent protein. And therefore the number of KVOI that actually can be generated. Under PS or pastel serine limiting conditions, the co-localization of CAV1 and cabin one become diminished and cabin one proteosomal degradation is the result. So if you don't have the right structure being formed, that protein goes through 
the ubiquitin proteosomal degradation pathway. Because the cell is recognizing you don't have enough phospholipid to make a KVOLR structure. So you need that anionic lipid. You see how specific it is to lipids. Now they used a rapamycin recruitable phosphatase. Okay, now that means that they went through the mTOR pathway. And it appears that depletion of phosphatase 4 phosphate and phosphatase 4 5 bisphosphate has a minimal impact on KVOLI assembly, but results in a completely decreased lateral confinement. So it has a tremendous effect downstream once the KVOLI are assembled. So there's another important bit of information that this research paper brought out to us. This is where these glycerol lipids, these are just the glycerol lipids, all those other gangliosides I show you is not even being talked about here. Are they involved? Yeah. Is cholesterol involved? Yeah. Okay. We, this is how science is done. Science takes a couple of very key features. Here they're looking at various proteins and they're looking at two different phosphoglycerol lipids, one of which is very important signaling, the PIPs, and one of this is more of a structural anionic lipid, phosphatidylserine. And they're asking what happens when you modify those lipids within that KVLR structure. They're finding tremendous effects, which can give you an idea of what's necessary versus what is, versus what may not occur. So that's the modularity, right? The modularity of the diagnosed necessary logical components for the KVLR, right? So when I say, when you, when you alter the, the mode of something, you're altering its necessity, its mere existence, and whether or not it can exist at all, right? So what is, what cannot be, and what must be? That's modal considerations, categories of what? of what exists, phenomena, right? What are the other ones? Quantity, quality, and relation, okay? Now that, all of that I'm just telling you is straightforward Aristotelian metaphysics. Now, why am I bringing it up right now? Because I brought it up here. I'm telling you these are different modes that you're looking at within a biochemical phenomenon. Now, why is it important you know that those are different modalities? because you have to consider the other three modalities. Quantity, quality, quantity, how much is there? Quality, what are the different fatty acids in those lipids? And then ultimately the relationship of those lipids to other things, right? The relational phenomenon. All of that, the cell is doing all the time because the cell is within a metaphysical, phenomenological universe, right? what is what can be and what cannot be right what is necessary what is simply occurring and what cannot occur i, I mentioned that a couple of times so you have an idea of the complexity of biochemistry and the fact that you're listening to the authentic biochemistry lectures now <clears throat> predominant plasma lemel anionic phosphatase serine therefore is essential for proper this is a conclusion so this is part of the induction process of this five-year-old paper. This is the induction process, making a concept now, which is an abstraction of all the deductive individual intuitions that were discussed and measured. Right? Intuitions here meaning just sense data, sense data like measurements, right? Which is what this, which what all research experiments do. We have uh, different kinds of tools in the laboratory that we measure these things, right? But ultimately, the measurement is the human central nervous system because we're the ones that made all of those different uh, lab equipment and we modulated them so they could measure certain things that we are saying exist in this system, things we've named, given names to, like all these lipids, right? right. An existential phenomenon there. Okay, I'm going to just do this next slide, then I'm going to probably stop because I don't know how much time we've gone through, but probably quite a bit. And this lecture is going to have a very, very important, couple of very more, uh, two very important 
endpoints. I know I'm not going to be able to get this paper was published in Fab's journal just a year ago, year and a couple of months ago. What do they tell me? Okay. So I told you this is research science I'm looking at, right? Not using a textbooks to go through. Now this diagram here might be a textbook. I don't know where I got it from. It doesn't matter. Oh, by the way, this diagram just showing you synthesis. So why don't we do this first? You start off with phosphatidic acid, which is a glycerol molecule with two fatty acids and the SN1, the SN2 position. And then the third carbon just has phosphate ester, OPO3, two minus. Right? Okay. You take phosphatidic acid and you, and you react it with, that's right, cytosine, triphosphate, that nucleotide, right? Kind of nucleotide, a pyrimidine, ribonucleotide, CTP, that's what that is. You get rid of phosphate, you strip off two of those phosphates and there it is, right? There's cytosine, there's a pyrimidine ring structure with the ribo sugar, right? And now it's attached to this lipid via this diphosphate, bond here, right? Yeah. So now you have CDP diacyglycerol. This calls it diglyceride. Obviously, this was um, this particular diagram was obviously made by someone in the European continent, because that's what they call things glycerides, not glycerides, right? They're diacyglycerol. Right? Anyways, fatty acid there, fatty acid there. We're not even telling you what that what those two fatty acids could be to give you a particular molecular species. Now that you made CDP diacylglycerol, you can react it with serine. You get rid of cytosine monophosphate, which can now be back to be triphosphorylated and used again, right? And you make phosphatidyl serine. You decarboxylate that amino acid and you make phosphatidylethanolamine. These are two very important glycerol phospholipids in the membrane. But you can also react CDP diacylglycerol with glycerol phosphate, again, leaving behind cytosine monophosphate. And now you've made phosphatidylglycerol, PG, which is another very important membrane lipid, particularly in certain organelles. In fact, you can make diphosphatidylglycerol, and that's cardiolipin, and that's the major membrane lipid in the intermitochondrial membrane. Just phosphatidylglycerol, that's a very important lipid in chloroplast membranes. Okay, so you have to get rid of the phosphate, yeah. So phosphatidylglycerol, and you make then this cardiolipin shown down here. That's what I just said, you dimerize it. All right, so this just shows you basic phospholipid metabolism. Now let's go and see what this paper tells us. Most phospholipids are made in the ER. So these reactions are happening in the anaplasmic reticulum. And they're distributed to other cellular membranes. So you have to have a way of mobilizing lipids to different membranes. Right? That's going to take what? That's going to take another order of complexity to specifically mobilize lipids from where they're synthesized to, say, a membrane lipid raft or to, say, the ER to the Golgi, to the plasma membrane, or the nuclear envelope, or the mitochondrial membrane, or the phagolysosomal component, you see? Vesicular transport contributes to the phospholipid distribution among the endomembranous system, okay? And moving through with vesicles. But exactly how phospholipids are transported to, from, and between mitochondrial membranes according to these papers, people were publishing this paper a year ago, still remains complete, not completely understood. To gain insights in the phospholipid transport routes into mitochondria, they express an E. coli phosphatidylserine synthase, okay? So they put a gene into these cells that would express that polypeptide, right? Which is going to synthesize PS, right? Phosphatidyl serine synthase, this enzyme. Phosphatidyl serine synthase, this enzyme. Using CDP diacylglycerol as the substrate, right? And of course, serine as the other, the amino acid, L-serine. So they did that. 
Uh, and stink membrane topologies in yeast cells, they did it in yeast, lacking a soul, so they knocked out the phosphatidylserine synthase, and that in the yeast is called CO1. The bacterial protein could complement the loss of the yeast gene, therefore the yeast polypeptide, when they target it to the ER, peroxisome, or even to lipid droplet, where periolipin is only found, lipid droplet membranes. So the synthesized, because of adding this bacterial gene, getting expressed as a protein, making that reaction, making PS, okay? So synthesized phosphatidylserine could be converted to PE, this decarboxylation reaction, okay, I already told you about. Uh, and it's a mitochondrial enzyme, suggesting that the phospholipid synthesized in the peroxisome and low doses can efficiently reach the mitochondria. Okay, so the lipid manufactured in the peroxisome, the PS, can make it to the mitochondria because we know that because you can make PE, which is a mitochondrially limited reaction because that's what the decarboxylation does. Okay. Furthermore, they found that that enzyme, the enzyme that synthesized phosphatidylserine, the bacterial one, which has been integrated in the mitochondrial inner membrane, the MIM, from the matrix side, could partially complement the loss of that uh, constitutive normal yeast gene, the CO1. So the fossil serine synthesized in the mitochondrial inner membrane was also converted to phosphatidylethanolamine, indicating that the fossil serine has to flop the, the mitochondrial inner membrane because that's how you can make the phosphatidylethanolamine. You have to flip that membrane over because that's where the decarboxylase occurs. <laughs> so those findings expand their understanding of intercellular phospholipid transport routes to be the mitochondria. They sure do. So this one Fabs journal paper then tells us, and the reason they did this modification, they wanted to know specifically when you synthesize a phospholipid via a heterologous system, you knock out the constitutive gene, you add the new one. Will that polypeptide that's targeted now to the specific location where they think it's necessary, right? It's going to carry out the rest of the processing of all these other phospholipids. And indeed it does. Now, what does that tell you when you read the paper? That tells you that all the components for phospholipid synthesis are working perfectly, canonically, hierarchically, in a teleological pattern to faithfully manufacture phospholipids in specific subcellular domains and compartments at stoichiometrically important relevant levels. Okay. Now they're not asking what are the molecular species of lipids, right? That would be even more interesting. Are the fatty acids that are found on the synthesized PE, for example, ones that are naturally occurring in these yeast cells? Okay, that would be another experiment. All right, so let's um, let's end the show here. Okay, so we got to the, about the middle of the slides. Uh, let's get over to here. Sorry. Yeah. So I'm going to end the lecture for now. I don't know how long it's been. It's probably been about an hour, I think. And hopefully that long introduction, if you haven't watched my video lectures before, give you an idea of what I do. Primary scientific literature, an explanation of how it integrates into the corpus of that research literature. And then moving forward to discuss things like, oh, mechanisms. Like, see, this is a pure mechanism paper. How do you make phospholipids? Whereas those other papers we're talking about, for example, cancer, right? So that's what I do. I go from biomedicine to very specific um, mechanistic papers. And in it, I'm drawing, uh, I'm doing a derivatization of an understanding of a membrane component, membrane biochemistry. And that membrane component we've been looking at via the ganglioside discussion. And 
don't worry, I'm going to get back to the ganglia sides. That's part two of this lecture. Okay. The KVOLI. Why am I talking about KVLA? Because they're very important plasma membrane associated phenomena. And I want you to know a whole lot about them because this is authentic biochemistry. Okay. And I am Dr. Dan Guerra, and I'm going to end here. Um, hopefully this lecture gave you again an insight in what I do. And if you're a, a companion of mine, you've been following me along all these three or four years I've been doing these video lectures, then thank you very much. And uh, please subscribe if you are not subscribing. Everybody should subscribe. You will learn a great deal by listening to my lectures. That is a promise. Okay. So Dr. Dan Guerra from the Inland Pacific Northwest of the United States of America on this afternoon, the 26th of July, 2022, saying bye for now.